자 계속해서 두 번째 초청 연사 모시겠습니다. 그 영국의 페로일 와트 대학의 수 로프 교수, 교수님이신데요. Designing Resilient Building Cities and the Citizen for 21st Century라는 주제로 여러분들께 귀한 말씀을 해주시겠습니다. 어, 수 로프 교수님께서는요 굉장히 화려한 경력의 교수님이십니다. 특히 뭐 이제 건축이나 도시 분야에서는 기후 변화 대응을 위해서 정말 많은 저술 활동을 하셨고요. 특히 도시 재생, 생태학적인 건축, 도시에 대한 세계적인 뭐 전문가로 인정을 받고 계시죠. 아, 한국에는 이번에 처음 방문한 걸로 알고 있는데요. 여러분께 아마 정말 값진 시간을 제공해 주지 않을까라는 생각을 합니다. 여러분 슬로프 교수님께 큰 박수 부탁드립니다. <laughs> Now let's move on with the second speaker. This is your first time in Korea, yeah? And please welcome on with the weekend. Thank you very much indeed. It's a great pleasure to be here and I'm delighted to follow that wonderful lecture by Don Kyung, Professor Don Kyung. It was absolutely segued into what I have to say about the creative future we have with green buildings. I want to talk to you about a very rapidly changing world, a world that every time it spins comes around in a different place. We have a choice of creating functional futures or dysfunctional futures. And the first question we have to learn is how do we understand risk? Risk can be divided into three parts. We have the hazard that we can calculate climate change, energy security, economic breakdown, social breakdown. We have ways of understanding that. Exposure, we know where we stand in relation to these various hazards. And vulnerability, how likely are we to fail with a particular hazard? It will depend on how rich we are, how poor we are, how sick we are, age, wealth, health, things like that. Understanding risk is absolutely vital. And the greatest risk we face is climate change. And as we can see here, we have the growth of CO2, growth of CO2 in the atmosphere, and that rapid increase that is escalating now to beyond 400 parts per million is going to be really perhaps the greatest challenge we face. And here we have the issue of to mitigate or to adapt. What many of us who've worked in this field for a long time didn't realize was how urgent the crisis is and that now we are faced with the need for rapid adaptation. All of the mitigation that we do now will not come into effect for another 30, 40, 50 years. But within the near future, this rise from one degree centigrade warmer than the long-term average rapidly to about 2040, 2045, to two degrees centigrade warmer, to three degrees centigrade warmer is going to shape the future of you and your children's generations because with two degrees centigrade rise in temperature, we are going to see absolutely chronic impacts. And the predicted potential to rise to four degrees centigrade warmer, to see the oceans acidifying, rainforests decreasing, reduce crops because of droughts. You think, how does that affect me? Well, it affects you very, very clearly, and it affects you today. We see issues like the shrinking of the ice caps, and we record them, but we don't feel them. We see events like Hurricane Haiyan, and you see the notice there, welcome to Takaban. We see the droughts in satellite pictures. But do we actually relate them to our own lives? How many of you remember the typhoons of, could I ask you that actually? How many of you, can you put your hands up, remember the typhoons of 2012 or 2013? Does anybody remember Typhoon Fitro here? 
No. Um, these issues are going to, they're quite close to home and they're increasing in intensity. And there is no, there's no gated community you can live in anywhere in the world. There is no economic protection against floods and storms and winds. And here we have the key issues. We have, whether you're on the beach at Takoban or here with Hurricane Sandy in some of the most expensive real estate in America, you're still equally affected. But exposure is not only where you live, it's the types of buildings you live in. And you can see here, this happens to be J.P. Morgan Bank in Houston in Texas with Hurricane Ike. Because, of course, the taller the building, the more extreme the wind forces it's affected by. You can see virtually every window there has been blown out. This is the Marriott Hotel in New Orleans. This is the day of, you can see the water in the streets, the day of um, Katrina. And down there you see City Hall, low, five or six stories, heavyweight building, naturally ventilated, no damage. You see the Marriott 18 months later, and they still haven't repaired it. And here's the issue. How much can we cover with insurance? Because in many parts, for instance, in Britain, we have something like 5% of all the homes in Britain are on floodplains. The insurance industry will insure them once more, and after that, they are no longer insurable. So the insurance industry here is being globally challenged. So we cannot see that as a safety blanket in perpetuity. Heat waves um, can appear to be distant, but for instance, the um, heat wave in Moscow in 2010 put up world food prices by significant percentages. And as we look at the pressures we're under, you can see that um, increases in food prices are significant in our weekly budgets. Here we see the European heat wave of 2003 in which something like 52,000 people died of heat in their own homes. You can see it as a small black outlier. Um, why is that not working? Okay, a small black outlier. By 20, 2030, that will be a summer that occurs every two years. By 2050, it's predicted that that summer will be a cool summer in Europe. So start to think about a very different future. It's exacerbated in large cities by heat island effects. And here you can see in the big shiny American cities in the red line, the heat island effect is much higher. In the lower, cooler um, European cities with more parks, it's much lower. But here's the issue with buildings and cities is the issue of peakiness. The idea that if you have certain building types, like the large glass buildings here, as soon as you get a very hot afternoon, then the surge in demand for air conditioning soars. And this peakiness of the energy demand, and you can see on the left, Australia, that top kilowatt hours in Australia, in South Australia, will cost you $10,000 a kilowatt hour to buy. But it also is um, very damaging. In Australia, New South Wales in 2008, 10% of all the generation capacity in the entire state was used for 1% of the year, that very hot afternoon. So are privatized energy companies going to build that capacity that they only use for 1% of the year? No because it's not cost efficient or effective to do so. Here we have 2003, the hottest afternoon of the heat wave of 2003. Everybody was still at the office with the air conditioning on. Some people had gone home already. And there was such a load or a surge on the electricity network 
the entire city went down for two days. 50 million people on the eastern seaboard without energy for two days. That's nothing. In July 2011, sorry, 2012, 250 million people without electricity for 24 to 48 hours. Because of this peakiness of buildings and cities. And if we're talking about brittle energy systems, None of us know better than the people in Japan, post Fukushima, how having a brittle energy supply system, centralized network based on fragile um, generation plants like nuclear generation plants, um, how dangerous that is too. And in 2003 in France, within two days, 15,000 people died, not least because they had to shut off all the inland nuclear power stations across the Loire because the rivers that were supposed to cool them dried up. And yet we're talking about energy rating schemes that produce platinum buildings like this. And we heard about the rating schemes. These are all lead platinum buildings. Do we really think that this is a rating scheme that's responsibly dealing with, with buildings. For instance, is a nice lead platinum building. It's called the Cheese Grater in London. It's by a Uruguayan architect called Vignoli, who built the Vidara Hotel in Las Vegas that is circular, all glass, high performance glass front, lead platinum building. It concentrates the solar rays so it actually burns holes in the um, swimming pool platform. And he, he built that in 2010, opened it. 2013, he opens a completely similar building in London that melts the, you see here? Melts the top of a Jaguar car. Lead platinum buildings. You see, the problem is with the 20th century where we had cheap energy the solution was a machine. The building was reduced to a fairly cheap box, whether it's glass or cardboard or chipboard, and the climate and nature were excluded. We have to re-engineer our dreams. We have to live now within the capacities of our economies and our ecosystems, and we have to live in a sufficiently equitable way that society does not break down. You see, resilience is about a system where you put pressure on it like a metal and the metal bends, the system bends. So for instance, in the ordinary home or the ordinary university buildings, you can charge more and more for energy bills and you get to a point where people can pay and yet the system starts to give. And your ability to your, the strain you can take will depend on how vulnerable you are, how wealthy, how old, how well positioned you are, what sort of social network have you around you. But there comes a point in which systems break. And that system co collapse is what we're facing around the world. This is Athens, dangerous society. This is 2008. That was four billion euros worth of damage done in a week. Look at London, it's Western economies too. A billion of damage done in August 2011. July, this is um, Istanbul, how much damage? We saw the Arab Spring spread like wildfire across North Africa. And this is an angry society. This is San Paolo. This is a society that's breaking. And that breaking point is, comes when the income of a family crosses over which ha with how much they have to spend. And in San Paolo, it was one bus ticket. One bus ticket went up. You can see it here. Um, and that was the bus ticket that they needed to buy to go to work. And they doubled the cost of that ticket and they couldn't afford it. Four million people on the street in a day. That system had broken. They reversed the bus ticket increase price. But we have to look very seriously. 
You see, in the energy-rich 20th century, all of our aspirations were centered on increasing living standards and incomes of citizens. This is the 20th century dream. It's almost an American dream, really. The biggest car in the car park, the biggest office at the top of the building. And I moved to teach in Arizona State University in 2007, the most rapidly growing state in America. It was boom city, brought on by cheap interest rates, as we heard described nicely in this last lecture. This is a city and a state that was in the pockets of the developers. The developers owned the politicians, they owned the universities, they owned the research, they owned the city authorities, they owned everybody. Developer was king. They bought chipboard, built chipboard ha houses out into the desert, miles and miles, bigger and bigger houses, right out in the hottest part. And if you were going to be aspirational, you moved out of Phoenix or Tempe and you moved into the desert into a sustainable community like Verado, where they had every single box ticked for the sustainable communities. Live, work, you know, economic well-being, tick, 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 tick. A bit like the platinum buildings that burns Jaguar cars. They were really living the dream in Arizona in 2007. And that's what happened. You see, this is where buildings and economies overlap. You had a city in which the heat island effect meant that you had a really hot, they got a, in July 2007, a very high heat wave. This is a city, I call it Blacktopolis. Everything is concrete, roads, bitumen, tin, metal, huge heat island effect. Year on year, the amount people had to pay to keep cool in their homes went up because of the heat island effect. From 1948, they just had to pay more and more to keep cool in their own homes, and the price of energy suddenly doubled. And then they found out that they actually didn't have enough water, so they had to start buying water. The price of food went up. Everything in their household budget went up. And this was the first state in the domino collapse of the housing market in America that went over the cliff. It failed. The end of suburbia. In the 2010 census in Phoenix, there were 261,000 empty homes in Phoenix, one city. In 2010, one in every, 17 of every home in Arizona failed. The system broke. So let's start dreaming. Let's rebuild a different dream. What would have happened if they'd built a cooler city? If they'd developed the old rail system? If they'd actually had light railway, electric railways to get them from their homes? Maybe um, run them on solar power towers? Maybe developed solar systems? And here, what happens if they'd built um, buildings and cities and homes that you could run on solar energy? You see, the problem is governance. You see, if we could see the future, would we act differently? This is what you call a, a process of backcasting. We all have the tools to change to make a better world, a safer world, but do we have the will to do it? And one of your South Korean cities, Daegu, started to be the first solar city. In 2001 and two, they did a backcasting. What they did was they got all the city officials into a room and they said, what will the world be like in 2050? And it wasn't the same as forecasting. They saw a very different future. And using that idealized future of a better world, they were able to develop a plan to build an energy innovative city an eco-city in which the individuals were actually trained to be, if you just, yeah, 
great. And they built um, a vision of a city in which industry, people, the economy, and the society could all work together to create a resilient future and economy for this city. And energy innovative city, eco-cultural city, and a new industrial city. And do you know what? They've actually gone out and done it. It's a solar smart city. They have planted a million trees in the last 10 years. They have green transportation system, solar energy center for South Korea. They've made it all photovoltaics. They have started the biggest um, Asian exhibition on solar energy and future energies. They have strategies for building 100 megawatts of storage. And they have led the dream of solar cities because that's the future. You see, in the 20th century, the idealized world was about equality of individuals within our eco-industrial systems. But I think we have to go beyond that now because the climate is changing so rapidly. We must design for resilience, for a greener future. And to do that, we have to do two things. 20th century vision is the building as the box with the machine in it. We have to reconnect now to the ambient energy flows, reconnect with nature and reconnect with people so that people aren't the problem anymore. We have to change our comfort standards so we use adaptive thermal comfort and not this ridiculous idea that you have one comfort temperature in buildings all year. Because simply by opening the window or relying on natural ventilation more, we can save 40 and 50% of our energy running costs and still be comfortable because although people are comfortable in those green spots in um, HEVAC buildings, in naturally ventilated buildings, people can be comfortable in a far wider range of temperatures. We have to go looking for cools and heat in buildings, harvesting different microclimates within buildings, and we have to start using storage in buildings. Here's number one Bryant Square where they store ice in the basement. So when they need, instead of being a peaky building that overheats, they, they actually use that solar energy to chill the ice stores in the basement so they don't have to cool during that hottest time of day. And here's how we do it. Here's a Chinese design competition for refurbished buildings showing us some of the ways forward. Things like orientation, you know, the rating schemes don't actually include orientation. Buildings that run on affordable solar energy, and here's a refurbishment of a hospital block, and you can see a whole new way that they're using photovoltaics to shave the peak off buildings and to create lifestyle issues as driving design as well. And also, issues of building height. How, how high would you want to live in the long term? This is all solar, solar systems being used on facades, whether it's passive solar or active solar systems. And the building itself is being redesigned to form storage, seasonal and diurnal storage. This is a new age for new, we were asked for um, standardization. It's a new language for buildings. This is moving beyond the modernist box idea into creating the form of a building. Here we've got solar hot water and photovoltaics on each balcony in a building providing shading and m various different ways of looking at integrating solar energy. So the buildings are run, they become power stations as well as buildings. Now, 15, 20 years ago, we were talking about energy efficiency, um, sustainability, adaptive thermal comfort, and these are all books we've read if anybody wants to know. But it's all about eco-design, actually. 
because 21st century buildings have to be about time, they have to be about place, and they have to actually be about architecture. Because architects have given up the responsibility for building performance to engineers. Well, take it back. Architects have to learn how buildings work because if you get the building wrong in the beginning, then it, we will never have a sustainable future. So really it's about retaking back architecture, designing with climate and nature, climate adaptive buildings for real people. This is Banda Aceh, nine years after, this was taken last week, nine years after the tsunami that wiped out the entire region. They've rebuilt the houses and every mile, you can see that looks like a high rise car park. That's the refuge building. You see, climate refuge building. That's where they all run to when the next tsunami comes. We have to build a generation of cities, communities, and buildings that are climate ready, that will keep us safe, and that are climate refuges already, because the climate is changing so fast. My grandfather was born in 1860. I was born in 1952. And at that rate, my granddaughter or my grandson will be born in when the global temperature has reached two degrees centigrade hotter than the long-term average. It's a very frightening world. We have a responsibility. It is our generation that has the responsibility not only to mitigate, which is at arm's length, but to adapt. The world is changing very fast indeed. Understand the risk, reconnect to the ecosystems. And it's architects and architecture that has to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you for your talk. Thank you for your talk. It was very interesting and informative. 네, 지금까지 영국의 헤로이드 와트 대학의 슬로프 교수님의 강의 잘 들었습니다. 디자인은 리즐랜드 빌딩 시리즈 앤 시리즈 포 21st 센트리라는 주제를 가지고 강의를 해주셨는데요. 정말 인상적이었습니다.